up that that you have. I mean, Isaiah chapter four, verse six is our text. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge for a covert from storm and from rain. I mean, I'll read that again. It's just one verse of scripture. It says, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. I mean, I want to talk to you this morning on this subject, the way through the storm. Why don't we lay down our Bibles and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Church, I need your help this morning. Let's be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Jesus, we believe you. Magnify your name, Jesus. I glorify you. I'm asking for your anointing upon every word that I say. So let me just say words, God, but let them be words that are effective. Effectual, fervent, the prayer of righteous men availeth much. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I trust you today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. You can be seated this morning if you promise to help me. Amen. Looking for, looking for some help this morning. Amen. Uh, we, we know that there are, uh, this, this city, this area has been plagued with storms recently. And how many have been affected by those storms? Their houses, their cars, various situations. I know that at our place, we had um, pretty high, I think dad mentioned 90 mile per hour winds the other night. And during that same wind storm, uh, not a lot of rain. There's, there's quite a bit of rain at the first part of it, but when the winds were blowing, it, it, it had really knocked everything loose already. And, and the, um, I had two large limbs fall off this. There's a tree that hangs over our house and two large limbs had fallen on top of the roof and thankfully not a lot of damage was done there's just one gouge uh, in some of the shingles and and so we'll get that taken care of especially when you know we're at this point in our life where we're getting ready to sell this house and so literally the week after we made the decision about who we're going to list this house with we have this this windstorm that knocks this tree over these limbs right on top of my roof and and so uh, on top of packing on top of all the work that we've got to do to get rid of uh, get rid of stuff and everything. Uh, we've got to also clear off our roof. And then I have a big bonfire behind my house ready to go. So if anybody wants to burn some wood or wants to uh, smoke some hot dogs, feel free to come over. I've got plenty of, uh, I've got a huge pile behind my house. But um, it was just added, added work, Brother Hall. There's added, uh, added work to my, to my list, my laundry list of things to do as I'm preparing this house for sale. And uh, not, not, it's not enough just to have to clean out the house and to repair all the cosmetic issues. But, but we've also now have this, have this situation that is the direct result of a storm that blew through just a few nights ago. Literal physical storms in our lives have an effect on us. They, as I just described in my personal situation, but no doubt many of you have witnessed. I know Brother Self and I were talking a couple of days ago. They had some serious hail uh, hail come through there and and it wasn't long ago earlier this year that they had hail and he was out of town and there was a lot of damage that resulted as a, as that that came about as a result of that and so literal storms have a direct effect on us can I get an amen from that how many of you remember when you were a kid you would run to mom and daddy's bedside and or you'd run to somebody who you trusted because the, the, the thunder was rolling and the, and the lightning was flashing and, and you didn't know what, what the consequences of these unknown, these, these, uh, foreign, these foreign activities that were happening. You didn't fully grasp and understand what was going on, but to you it seemed dangerous because it was a storm. It was a storm that came and then in the middle of the night and you've got to go find somebody that you trust. That's, that's 
what a storm. And, and as we grow into adults, we, we don't fear the lightning or the, the thunder like we did as children. But we know that the storm can have consequences, that it, that it can damage. And so our alert, uh, we, we're more alert, Brother Jerome. We're, our attention is raised because of the storm that's coming through. We see and we, we, we sense the wind as it beats against the house and the sheets of uh, rain that come down on the side of the house and we're just hoping beyond hope that nothing happens to the house that nothing happens to our vehicles that 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 we don't have too much damage to repair and man we're not scared of the lightning but we know what the lightning can do it could split a tree in half and and so we're concerned we're not we're not too fearful but but that childlike fear has grown into adult responsibility and we are concerned about the effect that the storm has in our life and um, because of that potential damage that follows the storm, our attention is uh, increased. We become more alert. I mentioned that. But, but I want to apply that to our spiritual lives, that, that every one of us have gone through certain circumstances, situations that, that are completely out of our control. If we wanted to, we couldn't stop the rain. If we wanted to, we couldn't stop the winds that are howling in the middle of the night. If we wanted to, if I wanted to, uh, and I sure did, I, did I, w I couldn't block Brother Parker, those, those, uh, those, those limbs falling on top of my house. Uh, the only thing, the only course of action that I had was to climb up on the roof afterwards and clean the mess up. That's all I could do. I couldn't do anything. We can do all kinds of things to prevent. We've got, I've got gutter shields on the thing, but they cause more problems than they really help. And we've got, we've got all kinds of preventative measures, maintenance that we do uh, amen, to protect ourselves. But when the storm comes, uh, friend, there's no way that we can measure its impact. And the same is true uh, in our spiritual life. We can pray uh, every day. Uh, we can fast uh, every week. Uh, we can read our Bible every day. Take the necessary preventative measures but when the storm comes the storm is here amen and you can't amen your your feeble hands amen your feeble body amen is no match for the storm that's coming hallelujah hallelujah but i'm here to tell you i want to help somebody amen if i if i may i'd like to give somebody a map to help you on your way through the storm i'm not giving you a so solution to dissolve the storm I'm not giving you uh, uh, the answer, uh, the, the magical formula, amen, to make the, the winds go away. I'm not Jesus. I can't stand on the bow of the, 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 bow of the boat and, and, and say, peace, be still. But what we can do is we can look at the pages of God's word and, and look at others who have gone through storms uh, similar to ours. And we can find a way, Brother Carter, bro, Brother Carver, through the storm. Hallelujah. How many want to go through the storm? Hallelujah. Amen. I believe this church has been plagued, uh, amen, by storms uh, spiritually over here and over there. Amen. I personally am aware uh, of various situations and families, uh, amen, that have been facing storms. And, and I'm not one, uh, amen, to be pessimistic. Uh, amen. I'm uh, and many times I'm too optimistic to a fault. Uh, amen. But I'm here to tell somebody under the unction of the Holy Ghost, uh, amen, that there is a way uh, through your storm. I'm not giving you the magic formula. I'm not going to give you, amen, the answer that will make it dissolve. But I'll give you some hope. I'll give you a way. I'll give you a light at the end of the tunnel. Hallelujah. Amen. Has anybody gone through a storm worse than Job? I don't, I don't know. I can't read of anybody that's, that experienced worse than Job. Hallelujah. The enemy had to go to the Lord and he said, uh, hey man, have you, hey, look at Job and the Lord, the Lord brought Job to his attention and said, have you seen my servant Job? And I'm not going to spend too long here. Hey amen. But I want you to consider, hey amen, the situation that Job went through. And after some 40 chapters of not just physical damage and physical storms that came through his life, but his friends turned their backs on him. Hey amen. Friends talked about 
them uh, for the majority of the book of Job. Uh, amen. But at the very end, uh, amen, when the whirlwind came, uh, amen, when the whirlwind came, uh, the Holy Ghost spoke to Job uh, out of the whirlwind. That's Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. In Job chapter 40, verse 6, he tells us the answer. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind. Hallelujah, I'm here to tell you, amen, that our storms, if we were not to go through them, we sometimes would not learn or receive direction that we need to receive. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that out of your storm, amen, from your storm, you're going to receive direction, amen, in the midst of your storm, amen, if you're attentive enough, if your attention is there, if you're alert enough, I'm telling you a word from God, amen, I believe a word from God is coming for you this morning, amen, in the midst of your storm. Hallelujah. 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 Then answer the Lord out, brother, for the Lord said, out of the storm, out of the whirlwind. Many of us see the whirlwind coming and we're afraid. And by the way, the things the Lord had to tell Job wasn't, wasn't any soft or easy, soothing statements. The Lord was setting Job straight. Some things that Job had already figured out. But at some point during this tumultuous time, he lost grasp of. And so the Lord set him straight again. Who are you, son of man? Question the one who created this universe, whose words spoke your existence into place. Hallelujah. Were you there when I stretched the heavens? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I recently heard one man preaching. Uh, amen. And he was talking about, uh, amen, how uh, Pentecost is becoming more like petty cost or pity cost. Man, don't let that be the case here. We don't have anything to pity, we don't have any reason to be petty. We've been blessed beyond measure. Amen. And I don't care if I never drive a Rolls Royce. I don't care if I never have the biggest house in town. Amen. If I have to live in a shack and the Lord's listening and it may have, have to be, but I'm here to tell you, I don't care what happens in my life. If I've got the Holy Ghost, that's all I need. This is the best life, living for God. Amen, it's the most blessed life. When I see, amen, the beautiful children of these families in this church, amen, coming up, amen, and seeing the glory of God on their faces after a move of the Spirit, there's nothing like that, Brother Larson. There's nothing like it. Amen, there's nothing like it, Brother Jahima. Amen, how God brought you out of that situation. God's giving you direction. He's giving you help. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It may have come through a storm, amen, but thank God for the storm. God speaks in the whirlwind. God speaks to us. God gives us direction. When the thing that we think is causing havoc and destruction, causing confusion in our life, if we pray, if we're sensitive enough, Martha, God will speak to us. Hallelujah. It's so easy, Brother Larson, for us uh, as soon as the storm comes. Well, here comes another one. Why does God keep making me go through this situation? Why me? Why my family? That's the wrong question, friend. It's what? The question is what? What do you have to show me? What do you have to say? I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Let's talk to the Lord right now. Ask the Lord to speak to us. Jesus, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to be sensitive enough, God, when you're coming through, that I can hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. He are not of us. God, I'm asking this morning uh, that those who are in the midst of a storm today, God, that they would receive direction, uh, that they would receive help, uh, that they would receive strength in this service today. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elijah thought he was alone. But he was dealing with Ahab and Jezebel. He went to the Lord and said, I'm alone. I'm the only one left serving you. We'll get there in just a minute, but the Lord said, you're not alone. That's, that's a lie from the enemy. That when we're in the storm, because we can't see our own hand in front of our eyes, figuratively speaking, we can't see beyond our own household. We can't see the pain and the storms weathered by other families in the church. That we think we're alone. We're the only one. But I'm here to tell this church that you're not the only one going through a storm right now. Amen. And God, furthermore, I'm here to tell you that God has you right in the middle of his will. But even better, he has you in the palm of his hand. Do you think that storm's out of God's control? Hallelujah. God's got absolute control. Hallelujah over everything. We'll, we'll get there. I'm jumping way ahead of myself, but strong east wind came, made the Red Sea dry over the Israelites. Let me just kind of set some of this up. Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back, and strong east wind all that night made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So can you see in this passage, in this simple scripture, that that it was wind, that the Lord used wind to drive the waters back. The Lord used the east wind to provide a pathway for the children of Israel to escape out of Egypt. When Job was in the wilderness, uh, when Job was in the wilderness, we've already made reference to these, so I won't read them again, but the Lord spoke to him out of a whirlwind. It was the wind. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Let me just jump down to verse 3. The word of the Lord came express, expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, the fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So in this passage, we see to Ezekiel where he had just received the word of the Lord, Scripture tells us that both wind and fire were evident. It was, it was evident there. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us that wind blew through that upper room. It was, an evident, it was a form of evidence that the presence of God, the Bible describes it as a rushing mighty wind. There was power associated with the wind. The Lord has used fire in the past. I just mentioned with Ezekiel, but in other passages, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, a bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. That was burning. There was fire involved in this, incident, in this incident with Moses. Exodus chapter 13 verse 21 tells us that by night the children of Israel were led by a pillar of fire. Exodus 19 and 18 tells us that the Lord des descended upon Mount Sinai in a fire. That was when Moses was on Mount Sinai praying. Leviticus chapter 9 verse 24 tells us there came out it came a fire out, of the, out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. So fire has been associated. Scripture tells us that our Lord is a consuming fire. I mean, fire has been used by the Lord throughout Scripture. I'm going somewhere. Let me just lay this groundwork here. But, so we, we, we see that the Lord has used wind. The Lord has used fire in, in various instances throughout Scripture. Also, he's used earthquakes. Now, Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, in that same situation where Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, the Bible tells us that after the Lord descended on it in fire, smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the last phrase says, and the whole mount quaked greatly. 
there was a quaking in Mount Sinai. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 tells us, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. When Jesus was resurrected, there was a great earthquake. Paul and Silas, when they were locked in prison, when they prayed and sang praises, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16 that there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Revelation chapter 6 Verse 12 tells us when the sixth seal was opened that there was a great earthquake. And then finally, when the Lord died on the cross, the Bible tells us that the earth did quake in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. However, for Elijah that day, when he felt so alone and separated from all of his countrymen, all of the children of Israel, in this desolate nation he felt, after they had totally backslidden, turned their backs on God. Elijah just goes, uh, if you remember the story, I, I believe it's in 1 Kings chapter 18 where he climbs, he ascends on top of, I think it's Mount Carmel, and he offers the, the offering, and you know they bring the barrels and barrels of, of water. They put the sacrifice up. When the Baal's prophets tried to uh, do a, do, you know, make an offering to the Lord, that there was, there were, the, the response was, was empty. There was no response from Baal. But when Elijah stepped up there, he prayed a simple prayer, made the offering, and the Lord consumed it with fire. So Elijah is walking away from this situation where the Lord literally just answered his prayer by fire. And now he's going off into a wilderness, running away from Jezebel, who he thought was running after him to kill him. And he goes into this cave in this situation. Let me just read for you what happens in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. He tells us he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? I want you to remember that question. The Lord asked him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Just pin that in your mind if you can. Verse 10, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy cup. He's describing the backslidden state of Israel. Everybody's turned their back on you, God. And, and he said, forsaken thy covenant, throw down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains. I want you to notice what's happening in direct response to Elijah's question to the Lord. Lord, everybody's turned their back on you. Everybody has, has thrown down your altar. Nobody's praying anymore. Nobody's serving you. As soon as he's done praying, the Bible tells us that a great and strong wind rent the mountains. Which I'm sure captured Elijah's attention. He's praying after the prayer that the, the, the storm comes through, tears the mountains apart. Where am I at? And break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Bible tells us the Lord was not in the wind. Now, he has been in the wind before. I just read a few sets of scriptures where he has used wind. But in this particular case, the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, the Bible tells us that there was an earthquake, another storm. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Now, I just read for you several passages where the Lord has used the quaking of earth to get the attention of his people. Amen. But, but in this case, in this situation, the Lord was not speaking or trying to speak to Elijah through the earthquake. 
They were very real situations. Don't get me wrong. They were very, very legitimate, undeniable circumstances that befell Elijah. I don't know if it became worse for him, but he's in this depressing state that he's thinking, I'm the only one left. And and now the winds are blowing and tearing uh, the mountains apart. The earth is quaking. uh, And then it seems like everything is falling apart. Verse 12, after the earthquake, the Bible tells us a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Three storms come through Elijah's life in direct succession. All beyond Elijah's control. All without his uh, ability to stop. But I'm here to tell you the Lord brought those storms into Elijah's life. uh, Amen. For one purpose. And that is this. So that he could hear what comes at the end of the storm. After the fire. After the earthquake. After the wind that was destroying mountains and shaking the earth. There came to Elijah a still small voice. Hallelujah. Now, here's the point that I want you to take notice of. After, amen, the the fire, the earthquake, and the wind, uh, amen, that still small voice speaks. Uh, I want you to take note of what the voice says. Verse 13. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that's the still small voice, he wrapped his face in the mantle. His mantle went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Just a few verses ago, before the storm, before the the earth was quaking, before the fire was raging, Elijah had already heard the voice of God. Yet for some reason, I don't know what reason it was, he couldn't pick his eyes off of his situation. And he couldn't focus in on what God had to say. Amen. So God had to bring, I'm here to tell you, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, amen, that God has brought these storms into your life so that you can hear the word that he's already given you. The message is not going to change, amen, but you have to change your perspective, your perception, your focus, amen, what you're listening to, where you're going, where your focus is, whether or not you're going to obey. Hallelujah. The message is, somebody hear me this morning. The message is the same. Amen. I know that somebody did you wrong. I know. Amen. It's possible that your, that, that your work did you dirty. Amen. That there are very justifiable reasons for you to be upset. Hallelujah. But this storm is here so you can hear the voice. The storm has come through. Your earth is shaking. Your fire is raging. Your winds are blowing. So you can hear that still small voice. Elijah! What? What do you think about what Elijah was doing? Elijah is the prophet of God for the nation of Israel. He's supposed to be giving a word. He's supposed to be giving direction. He's supposed to be helping this desolate nation turn back to God. They just had a tremendous move of God, if you will, on top of Mount Carmel. And yet he runs away in fear, just like it was when we were children, running away. I don't like the way the winds are blowing over here. I don't like the noises that I'm hearing. Somebody listen to me this morning. I don't like it. I'm uncomfortable here. And I'm here to tell you where you're uncomfortable is where God wants you to be. God wants you to be in that city. I'm not just trying to come up with slogans or say things. I'm trying to help somebody this morning. Understand that you're right in the middle of the will of God. And your storm is there to show you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's talk to the Lord right now just for a moment. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, come on, church. Let's lift our voices and talk to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, Savior. 
Hallelujah, Savior. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. His message is not going to change. His word for you is not going to change. We've just got to obey it. Got to do what he asked us to do. And then you can read the following scriptures and see what, what happened. The Bible tells us that he went and returned to uh, the, uh, he went and returned and he anointed Elijah. He anointed a king for Syria. He, anointed a, he went right back to work. Amen. But he just needed these storms to get his attention, to get him focused again. To get, them, to get them back on track. And I'm telling you this morning, the Lord will send as many storms as necessary to get you on track. He's going to send as many moments to get your attention as He has to. The best thing to do it's just to listen. Not ask questions. Why? Why me? I've been there. I have been in situations where I'm asking why. Why do I need to go through this? First of all, the Bible tells us that he won't put on us more than we are able to bear. Therefore, if you're going through the storm, he knows you're able to, to make it through. But there's a reason he's putting you through the storm. Elijah, you're not listening. Elijah, what are you doing here? God, I'm in the middle of a storm. Yeah, I know. I sent the storm. What are you doing in the cave? God, the whole nation is falling apart. They, they've thrown down your altars. I know. I need you in the nation. I need you to preach. I need you to talk to them. What are you doing here? Your way through this storm, Elijah, is to get out of this cave. Your way through this storm, Elijah, is to stop hiding. You've got to get out from behind the cleft that you think you're so secure behind. I'm telling you, if God wanted to, he could blow the rocks apart that you're hiding behind. But he knows what you're able to withstand. And he's doing what is necessary to get your attention, to help you see. There's so much, I feel the Holy Ghost all over me right now. There's so much potential in this building right now with the children of God that are sitting on these pews. And yet we can't get our eyes off of our situations. Hallelujah. I know the storm seems too strong. The winds seem like they're blowing everything apart. The fire continues to rage. You know what you need to do? You need to find an altar. Say, Lord, I'm trying to hear you. Let me take my eyes off of the mountains. Take my eyes off of the fires. Let me take my eyes off of the winds. Would you speak to me this morning? I'm telling you, when the still small voice comes, you will know it. You will hear it. It's a clear voice. It, it dissipates all of the confusion. It drives away every question that you had. You can conjure up the questions like Job did, but in your heart, you'd know. Though he slay me, <laughs> I know he's got everything in order I know he's got everything in the palm of his hands I know that 
whatever I'm facing right now. Job's wife said, why don't you curse him? Woman, you're speaking like a foolish person. How did he have such clarity then? But at the end, he was so confused. It's because he took his eyes off of what the Lord was doing. He started focusing on what his friends were saying. What people were talking about him. Child of God, I wish I'm doing everything in my power to make this clear for you. There are families in this church that are going through storms that need an answer. The disciples were in the middle of the sea of Galilee. At the, at the request of Jesus, by the way, Jesus said, let us pass over. Let's go from this side to that side. Wouldn't that be awesome? On over to the side where revival is. On over to the side where many souls are praying through to get to the Holy Ghost. On over to the side where your lost loved ones are, are filled with the Holy Ghost. Why don't we pass over to that side? The disciple says, sure. The Bible says they followed Jesus into the ship. And then that ship hit the waves. And they get out, and man, smooth sailing. We're on our way over to the other side. Oh, 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 hallelujah. Church, we started this year out. The Lord had done some wonderful things. We started out smooth sailing, and then the enemy, guess what happened? Really what happened is we got the enemy's attention. And then he began to start throwing things our way. I'm telling you, whatever the enemy means for evil, God can work it out for good. The enemy has absolutely no control. He can only throw up obstacles. But you know what God does? He takes those things and turns them and makes them work out so that we can we can learn. And, and furthermore, the things that he put in, in Job's life, Brother Jerome, we learned that the devil had to ask for permission in every situation that he put in Job's life. So I'm here to tell you that no matter what the enemy is doing, I mean, the Lord, the, the Lord has approved those storms for a purpose. He's the one that bid you to come to the other side. He's the one that called you to step out. And now you're in the middle of a storm. That's what happened for the disciples. They're crossing over Sea of Galilee, and then the clouds started rolling in. The wind started picking up. The waves started crashing. The Bible says that the waves filled the ship. And guess where Jesus was? That's right, he was sleeping. And the disciples went to him and woke him up and said, Master! Don't you care? He said, don't you care that we perish? They thought they were going to die. I'm here to tell you the Lord while he may have been sleeping in his flesh he was well aware of the situation that was going on reading Mark chapter 4 verse 35 let's just pick up the end of that it says let us pass over to the other side when they had sent away the multitude they took him even as he was in the ship and there were also with them other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, the Bible tells us, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto them, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Haven't you seen the miracles I've done? How long have you been living for God? How long have you been in his presence? How many times have you seen him do it for somebody else? How many times have you seen the lame picked up, the blinded eyes opened, and the the deaf ears opened? I think that was underlying the question that Jesus asked. What? How is it that you have no faith? I'm not going to let you pass away. I'm not going to let you perish. I knew you could withstand this storm. The Lord is in this place this morning. If we all stand together. I don't know the details, what you're facing, but the Lord does. You might feel like he's back there sleeping, but his eyes are on you right now. With so much as a whisper, with so much as A simple prayer, as long as you're sincere, I believe the Lord will give an answer. Why don't we all come to these altars and talk to the Lord this morning and pour our hearts out to him. Lord's not going to, he can, he can speak the words and the seas. And the waves and the winds have to listen. And if that's his will, he can do it. But perhaps he wants you to hear something after the winds. Something after the waves. Something after the fire. Hallelujah.